welcome to the third lecture in uh, literary criticism. Uh, my name is Dr. Fuzi Slisli, and I will be presenting this third lecture for you. Um, this is a one of two lectures on criticism in ancient Greece, and we will be looking at the contribution of ancient Greek philosophers uh, to the theory of literary analysis. Um, so before we get started, I just want to make uh, uh, four quick observations. The first one is that there is no genre of literature that we have today, whether it's tragedy, comedy, the different forms of poetry, the short story, even the novel, that the Greeks didn't develop themselves. Um, so that tells you the magnitude of the Greek contribution. The Greek contribution is huge and phenomenal and in, to some extent even today we are only beginning to understand the magnitude of the Greek contribution to uh, the culture that we have. The second uh, observation that I would like to, ma to, to make is that yes, Western literature is based on Greek literature but as the previous lectures showed and as we will see in the following lectures the reality is more complex which means that western literature is based on greek literature but there is also a substantial amount of differences between western literature and greek literature and we will talk about some of these differences today the third observation is that greek thought influenced in one way or another um, every single literary form that developed in Europe and the West. So every form of literary uh, uh, of literature that developed in Europe and the West has been influenced in one way or another by Greek thought and Greek literature. But the differences between European and Western thought and Greek thought and literature remains significant. So this lecture and the next one um, will look at two influential Greek thinkers who have influenced the development of Western literature and criticism uh, more than any other thinkers in history. These two thinkers are Plato and Aristotle. So um, let's start with Plato. Plato will be the subject of uh, this lecture and Aristotle will be the subject of the next lecture. So, um, Plato, Plato's critique of poetry. I say poetry because, as we will see, uh, the Greeks did not have a word for literature, did not have the idea of literature as a creative form of literature. They called everything that we, we call today literature, the Greeks simply called it poetry. So even tragedy, comedy, for the Greeks, they simply call them poetry. So today we're going to talk about Plato's critique of poetry. Um, first thing to note about it, it is extremely influential and extremely misunderstood. Extremely influential, has huge influence, but at the same time it's extremely misunderstood. Um, Plato wrote dialogues in um, and in every single one of these dialogues, I'm talking about 25, 30 dialogues, a big number of dialogues, and in every one of these dialogues, he addressed poetry, he talked about poetry. He was, in a way, um, critics describe him as someone who has been obsessed with poetry throughout his life. But to the present, Western literature and criticism cannot agree why Plato was so obsessed with poetry. Some critics love him and some hate him, but they all respect him. Plato's most important contribution to criticism appears in his famous dialogue, The Republic. This is one of his most famous dialogues, The Republic. Here, two main ideas appear in this dialogue. And these two ideas have had a lasting influence, huge influence. The following lecture will present these two ideas and then provide some analysis of these two ideas. 
Um, we're interested in two chapters of the Republic. The first one is Book 10 of the Republic, and the second one is Book uh, 3 of the Republic. And when I say Book 10 and Book 3, uh, they're simply chapters. The chapters of the Republic are simply called Book 1, Book 2, Book 3. It simply means Chapter 1, Chapter 2, Chapter 3. So Book 3 and Book 10 of the Republic are uh, the two chapters that we are interested in in this lecture. Two ideas em emerge in these two books that have had a huge and lasting influence on Western literature. First, let's look at Book 3 of the Republic. In Book 3 of the Republic, Plato makes the very important distinction between mimesis and diegesis. Uh, these are two concepts, mimesis and diegesis, and I'll explain them in a little while. Mimesis, M-I-M-E-S-I-S, -I -S, and diegesis, D-I-A-G-E-S-I-S, -S, mimesis and diegesis. These two concepts remain very important for the analysis of literature today. They are often translated as imitation and narration, or showing and telling. Um, Briefly, to explain what it means, mimesis and diegesis, uh, imitation and narration, showing and telling, it's very simple. If I tell you a story, for example, about Napoleon's invasion of Egypt, Napoleon decided to go and invade Egypt, conquer Egypt. So if I tell you the story of Napoleon's inv invasion of Egypt, I have many ways to tell you that story. I can tell you the story in the third person. So I would say, Napoleon sailed to Alexandria with 30,000 soldiers. Then he, using the third person, then he marched on Cairo. Then he conquered the city. Then he, so I'm using the third person. Um, I am different from Napoleon. Uh, and I am telling you the story. Napoleon is just a character in this story. This is narration. I am telling you the story of Napoleon. But if I tell you the story in the first person, as if I am, as if I were Napoleon, so I would say, I sailed to Alexandria with 30,000 soldiers. Then I marched on Cairo. Then I conquered it etc., etc., etc. If I do that, that would be an imitation, that would be a mimesis. Um, I would be showing you the story. I am acting as if I were Napoleon. I am showing you the story. If I tell you the story using the third person, he sailed to Egypt, that would be telling you the story. So this is the basic difference between showing and telling. Drama, uh, the theater, usually shows you a story. A film usually shows you a story. But a novel, most of the time, tells you about a story, and the hero or the protagonist of the story is uh, uh, talked about in the third person. He or she did or went or sailed and so on and so forth. So this is basically the distinction between mimesis and diegesis, imitation and narration, showing and telling. Plato makes this distinction in Book 3 of the Republic. Um, for example, when he says, but when the poet speaks in the person of another, meaning speaks in the person of another, so if I am the poet, I will speak in the person of Napoleon, I would say I. So when the poet speaks in the person of another, may we not say that he assimilates his style to that of the person as he informs you is going to speak. So when I speak, it's like Napoleon is speaking. Um, and in the text it says, certainly. And this assimilation of himself, meaning the poet, to another, meaning the character, either by the use of voice or gesture, is the imitation, mimesis, of the person whose characters he, the poet, assumes. Of course. Then, in that case, the narrative of the poet uh, 
may be said to proceed by way of imitation. Very true. This is the, the passage in the Republic in which Plato makes this distinction between mimesis and diegesis. Plato was the first to explain that narration or storytelling, storytelling, what we call in Arabic as sard, that storytelling, narration, can proceed by narration or by imitation. He's the first, this is the first time, the first known instance when a thinker makes this distinction. And he says, and narration, narration, may be either simple narration or imitation or a union of the two. That means that a story, the same story, can proceed by imitation or by narration or it can mix the two styles together. This distinction has been very popular in Western literary criticism and it remains today very important for the analysis of literature. We will see in future lectures how useful it is or it has been even to 20th century schools of criticism like formalism and structuralism. Um, Let's move now to Book 10 of the Republic, the second important idea in Plato's Republic. In Book 10 of the Republic, Plato introduced another idea that has produced strong reactions in Western literature and criticism. And this one has been more difficult to understand. This is the uh, instance where Plato famously, he, it's very famous, he decides in Book 10 of the Republic to ban the poet and poetry from the city. He says, that's it. We don't need the poet in our city. We're going to ban the poet from the city. So, um, it's, it's an interesting thing to think about. So he thinks about, he tries to elaborate uh, a city and he says, in this city we don't need the poet, we don't need poetry, we're going to keep them out. They're not coming into our city. Because European and Western cultures have always valued poetry, literature and art, Plato's decision has been difficult to understand and difficult to explain. Why did he do that? Western cultures have always claimed that their practice of literature and art are based on Greek antiquity. But all of a sudden, here is the most important Greek philosopher rejecting art and poetry and banning them from the ideal city. So this is a contradiction in terms. How are we going, how, we, how are Western critics going to explain that the most important Greek philosopher rejects poetry, but Western philosophers and Western critics tell you that their poetry and art are based on Greek antiquity. Um, the, it's very, um, there is a lot has been written about this and it's, it would take a lot of time to go through uh, even a, a small amount of what has been written about this issue. But I am just going to summarize it using a quotation from Christopher Janoway uh, from his book Images of Excellence, Plato's Critique of the Arts. Christopher Janoway succeeds in summarizing the various reactions uh, in European and Western culture to Plato's decision to ban poetry and the poet from his city. So this is what Christopher Janoway says. He says, they protest too much, meaning the critics. They protest too much. Plato is assailed, meaning attacked. Plato is assailed with, quote, gross illogicality and unfairness. So they accuse him of being illogical and unfair. They accuse him of being passionate, hopelessly, uh, that it's a passionate, hopelessly bad argument, right? So sometimes they just say, well, Plato is hopelessly uh, uh, passionate and it's a bad argument. They say that, it's, that Plato's argument is trivial, unimportant, or that it's sophistic, right? It's a sophistic ar argument. And that uh, it's not conclusive anyway. This isn't a conclusive uh, 
analysis of poetry and they say that this is a position which is quite unacceptable. How dare he? How dare he attack the institution of art and poetry? Um, others, they would just say that, well, Plato is just enjoying himself by overstating his case. That uh, they would say that if we compare what he says about poetry in other books, then we might see that uh, this, this decision to ban the poet in the Republic is not, doesn't constitute his real opinion. Um, <clears throat> and that they argue that we should construct a theory of art and poetry for Plato from his other books and then just ignore this decision here in the Republic. Um, <clears throat> some critics have even tried to write imaginary dialogues with Plato trying to convince him that look this is art you can't ban art you can't ban poetry when something is when something is art or poetry it has the following qu qualities a b c d and then you know they think that they can convince him but he's dead he can't answer and it's pointless to try to you know convince him at this point um, it's only in the 20th century that some scholars finally showed that the poetry that Plato talks about and bans is different from the poetry and art that Europe and the West have. Paul Chrysler, for example, uh, drew attention to the fact that the Greeks did not have anything similar to the Western idea of art and literature. Paul Chrysler, he says the Greeks didn't have art and literature. Uh, the Western idea of art and literature did not even exist in Greece or even in Rome. They had something, they had poetry, but they didn't treat it the way we treat art and literature, and we cannot say that they're the same. So Paul Chrysler says the Greek term for art and its Latin equivalent, ars, do not specifically denote the fine arts in the modern sense but were applied to all kinds of human activities which we would call crafts or sciences. What this means basically is that what we call the fine arts, les beaux-arts, uh, al funun al jamila, what we call uh, the fine arts today, in ancient Greece or in ancient Rome, they were classified part of crafts, crafts meaning you know, handiwork, things that were crafts or part of the sciences. For example, music was classified as part of the sciences. It wasn't. And, and, and poetry was classified with the crafts. The poet was a craftsman. He was a wordsmith, right? Someone who works with words and put words together. Uh, so this was... Uh, Paul Chrysler in uh, a journal, in a, a paper called The Modern System of the Arts, published in 1951-1952. A decade later, about 10 years later, Eric Havelock confirms the same point. He says, neither art nor artist, as we use the terms today, can be translated into archaic or high classical Greek. The word that we have, art, is impossible to translate into Greek language because they didn't have anything similar to what we call art today. So the Western institution of the fine art, or le beaux-arts, al-funun al-jamila, or even the concept of aesthetics, ilm al-jamal, um, as a system that includes on the basis of common characteristics those human activities, painting, architecture, sculpture, music, and poetry, these are the five constituents of uh, the fine arts in the 18th and 19th century. The fine arts are made up of these five uh, uh, activities, painting, architecture, sculpture, music, and poetry. They're put into a system together, and it's called the fine arts. So, um, <clears throat> this system, 
that includes these five activities and separates them from the crafts and the sciences is the product of the 18th century. It's in the 18th century only that this was created. Before that, these five activities, painting, architecture, sculpture, music, and poetry, some of them were part, was part of the sciences, some of them were part of crafts. Um, <clears throat> Paul Chrysler says the basic notion, the basic notion that the five major arts, painting, sculpture, architecture, music, and poetry, the notion that these five arts constitute an area all by themselves, clearly separated by common characteristics from the crafts and from the sciences and other human activities, has been taken for granted by most writers on aesthetics, from Kant, Immanuel Kant, to the present day. Even today you still find people that think that this, this group of activities, the fine arts, has always been like that. That's not true. It hasn't always been like that. These five activities used to belong to the crafts, to the sciences, or to other type of activities. It's only in the 18th century that they were grouped together and critics decided to call this system the fine arts. It is freely employed even by critics, by those critics of art and literature who profess not to believe in aesthetics, in beauty, and it is accepted as a matter of course by the general public of amateurs who assign to art with a capital A that ever narrowing area of modern life which is not occupied by science, religion or practical pursuit. So this is Paul Chrysler uh, in 1951-52. So if our modern system of the art is new and only, was only created in the 18th century, then what kind of poetry is Plato talking about? If it's different from ours, then how different is it? And why did he ban it then, right? Um, first thing to note, first thing to notice is that Plato does not use the word literature or the word art. He uses the word poetry, as I said earlier. The discipline that we call today literature, literature, is an 18th century invention. In the ancient world, in ancient Greece or Rome, um, they only talked of poetry. Even tragedy and comedy were all known as poetry. Uh, the poet could be a tragedian like Sophocles or Euripides. The poet could be a comedian like Aristophanes. Or the poet could be an epic poet like Homer. But the Greeks never called any one of these poets artist, or, uh, and they never called any of their plays or poems literature. They called it poetry. So the poet that Plato describes in the Republic as Eric Havelock shows, is a poet, a performer, and an educator, right? Uh, this is just, let's just look now at the characteristics of the poet that Plato talks about. Well, he gives this poet three characteristics. He's a poet, a performer, and an educator at the same time. Um, why is the poet confused with the performer and the educator? Um, what this shows us is that the poetry, poetry in ancient Greece, was not just entertainment or, you know, reading, you know. It was a source of serious knowledge and education to the society. Um, it is only in an oral society, a society that doesn't have a system of writing, that poetry becomes the most principal source of knowledge and education. When a society doesn't have a system of writing, then poetry becomes the source of knowledge and of education. The reason is that uh, in a society that doesn't have a system of writing, poetry becomes useful to record and preserve knowledge. Because you don't have a system of writing, you have to find ways to remember laws, culture, religion, education, science, all the useful things that 
the useful ideas that a society has. We have to find ways to preserve it so that we can pass it to the next generation. And when there isn't a system of writing, we only have memory. And memory can work uh, very well if we use some tricks. And the best trick to use to make memory remember easily and to remember a lot of things would be to use language in specific ways. So if we take language and organize it using rhythm, meter, harmonies, right? It becomes easy to remember. Just think yourselves how easy it is to remember uh, proverbs. Proverbs are very easy to remember and it's because there is a reason for that. Because proverbs are usually uh, contain rhythm, rhythm and rhyme, or they're rhythmic or poetic, and in, that makes them very easy for memory to just quickly remember them. Um, uh, so this is why poetry in an oral or semi-oral society like Plato's society, ancient Greece at the time, it wasn't, there was some literacy people used writing, but it was still semi-oral. Most of the people still didn't read and write. And therefore, poetry was still very important for education, for religion, for the preservation of knowledge, and for the transmission of knowledge. So, because poetry uses rhyme, meter, and harmony, those make language very easy to remember, just like Proverbs. Um, <clears throat> in that sense, that makes poetry in an oral or semi-oral society not just a form of entertainment like we have today, uh, but a, a, a storehouse of knowledge, a storehouse of customs and tradition. Poetry is also the medium of communication. People communicate with each other using poetic references. <clears throat> of course, this poetry is vastly different from the uh, Western institution of literature or arts. Uh, just to give you basic comparisons, literature, European and Western literature, is an interaction between a reader and a book, right? Oral poetry is a communal performance where there is the, the tribe and the village and the city. It's always a communal experience. But literature today and art is a, an interaction between a reader and a book. Literature today is entertainment and pleasure. Oral poetry teaches science, medicine, war and peace. It teaches social values and so on. The writer today, the writer or artist today, is, you know, a gifted individual. He's like a genius, a gifted individual. The poet in an oral society is a leader, an educator, a warrior, and a priest. All of this at once. So the poet in ancient Greece was much more bigger thing than what we call the poet or the artist today. These distinctions are important to understand, to understand why Plato saw the poet as a big danger on his society. Um, so let's ask the question now, why did Plato ban poetry? Very simple. Plato thought, or argued, he found that poetry cripples the mind. It cripples it. It makes the mind unable to think. And basically, Plato accuses the poetic experience, all the poetic experience of his time, of conditioning the citizen to imitate and repeat uncritically, without thinking, the values of a tradition without grasping it. The citizens, Plato says, are trained to imitate passively passively, without critical, uh, the use of critical faculties. The citizens are trained to imitate 
passively an already poor imitation provided by the discourse of poetry. Uh, he says basically that the poet claims to know everything. The poet claims to know about war, about science, about religion, about funerals, about war, about peace, about everything. But he said that's not true. No one can know everything. It's impossible. So the poet is only good at making songs, making songs that sound pretty, that sound good. But as far as the content of those songs, uh, Plato says the poet is as ignorant about that content as his own public is about those contents. So, in that sense, the poet produces only a poor copy of things he thinks about. If he talks about science and war, he's only, uh, produces, he only produces a poor copy of those things. And those who listen to him and believe him they acquire a poor education. Poetry simply excites the senses because, you know, all it has are rhythm and rhyme and sound and harmonies and stuff. It just tries to dazzle you. You would think, wow, that's beautiful, that sounds wonderful. But it's not a good education. Poetry excites the senses and neutralizes the brain and the thinking faculties. It produces docile and passive imitators. The people who are educated on the poetic culture are docile imitators. Um, so this is basically the main point in Book 10. This is why Plato uh, bans poetry, because uh, the entire system of education in ancient Greece was based on poetry and Plato found that it was not very smart to base an entire system of education on poetry. But to understand it properly, this discussion in Book 10 of the Republic, we have to look at Books 2 and 3 of the Republic because it's in, it's in these two books that Plato describes how unhealthy Greek society was. He says, all men believed in their heart that injustice is far more profitable than justice, right? He says, virtue and justice are considered painful and unrewarding, but vice and injustice are not only easy and practical, but also rewarding. People think that injustice is rewarding and practical. And being just and fair, it's like too much trouble and too much hustle, and there is no rewards in it anyway. So why do I have to be just and fair? Why can't I just do the easy way and be unjust and unfair and reward myself with that? Plato blames traditional education, the traditional education given to the youth. He says it does not mean the standards of justice and virtue. Then he blames, he blames the parents and the teachers and their accomplices. If parents and tutors tell their children to be just, he says, if the parents and teachers tell their students to be just, it is for the sake of character and reputation and the hope of obtaining for him who is reputed just, some of those offices, marriages, and the like. So people basically just encourage their children and their students to seem to appear just. They don't encourage them to be just. And he says this is a very unhealthy situation. And of course, Plato says the authorities that people appeal to to justify this education are the poets. So Homer, Mosius, Orpheus, these are the you know, most famous poets of ancient Greece. Uh, Plato cites all of them to give an illustration. Um, very important point, some people, um, some critics in the past uh, have said that Plato is just 
too puritanical. He doesn't like enjoyment. He doesn't like art. He wants a uh, system where, you know, that's all moralistic and it's just about morality. That's not true. Plato says if people just laughed about these stories, about these poems, it wouldn't be bad if they just laughed about it. But the problem is that they use these poems and these plays as a serious source of education and of law. And in this instance, if they use it as a serious source of education and law, Plato asks, how are people's minds going to be affected by the poetic experience that if they are exposed to it night and day, in private and in public, in weddings and funerals, in war and in peace? He says, what about, especially, What's the impact on those who are, quote, young, quick-witted, and like the bees on the wing, light on every flower, unquote. He, say, he asks, who are they going to, how are they going to deal with this suspicious educational material that's poured into their minds and into their ears every day? He says, they are prone to draw conclusions and to learn lessons from it. And to explain how this works, how poetry affects the way people think, Plato analyzes poetry, the poetry of his time. He analyzes it from two perspectives, form and rhythm. <clears throat> so, uh, sorry, form and content. First, um, the form. Plato says that the charm of poetry, the strength of poetry, its power, reside in its rhythm, harmony, and measures. These are the colors, he calls them the colors of poetry. Without them, he says, poetry loses most of its charm and its appeal. It just becomes prose, and prose doesn't have charm and appeal like poetry. The poet, he says, is just good at the aesthetic adjustment of his verses. He's just good at like spinning his verses and putting them together. Um, but he is actually ignorant about the content of his songs and tales. He is a good, the poet is a good craftsman in terms of putting together these poems and using the appropriate rhythms and melodies to achieve the desired effect on the listener. But as far as the actual matters he thinks about, the content, the subject of these poems, he is, the poet is as ignorant about them as his ignorant audience. The poet's craft, the poet's craft, Plato says, only demands a super, superficial knowledge of things, just enough to be able to give an imitation of them. Um, there is a uh, passage in the Republic where Plato explains this. He says, the poet with his words and phrases may be said to lay the colors of several arts, of the several arts. The colors, these are rhyme, rhythm, meter, harmony. He calls them the colors of poetry. The poet himself lays these colors, himself understanding their nature only enough to imitate them. And other people who are as ignorant as the poet and judge only from his words, imagine that if he speaks of cobbling or of military tactics or of anything else in meter and harmony and rhythm, he speaks very well. He's telling, you know, he's uh, knowledgeable. Such is the sweet influence which melody and rhythm by nature have. And I think that you might have observed again and again what a poor appearance the tales of poets make 
when stripped of the colors which make which music puts upon them and credited and are recited in simple prose he said you know try to read some of these po poems just in simple prose and see how much that they will not be appealing anymore they would just you know sound just like a piece of writing and form in an oral society is not only verbal it's also physical so the oral poet relies equally on gestures movements and mimicry and these two can have a powerful impact on an audience like the poet's words these uh, meaning these verbal and physical movements they divert attention from what is actually being said and only aim to impress the spectator by the skills of the delivery Plato says in the Republic he says and he will meaning the poet and he will be ready to imitate anything not as a joke but but in right good earnest and before a large company as I was just now saying he will attempt to represent the roll of thunder the noise of wind and hail or the creaking of wheels and pulleys and the various sounds of the flutes pipes trumpets and all sorts of instruments so the poet can do all these things together his entire art will consist in imitation of voice and gesture and there will be very little narration so Plato says exposing the youth young people to poetry from childhood to adult age is a simple indoctrination and propaganda the youth in this instance the youth will be educated to rely on their emotions rather than on their reason this is why Plato says that poetry cripples the mind it weakens the critical faculty and breeds conformity creates conformity people just want to confirm and live and you know stay out of trouble he says did you did you never observe he says how imitation beginning in early youth and continuing far into life at, at length grows into habit and becomes a second nature affecting body voice and mind um, imitation starts in human beings at a very young age and if they're educated on poetry it can become like second nature right um, <clears throat> basically Plato says that the mixture of rhythm and colorful images can have a strong and powerful impact on the listener because rhythm and harmony he says find their ways into the inward places of the soul on which they mightily fasten um, so in that sense this is why poetry is dangerous because it controls people through their emotions and discourages them from using their rational faculty um, <clears throat> Plato's merit, his merit, his contribution, is that he distanced himself from these experiences. He took a step back and tried to understand and realize that the passivity effect, you know, that people have from poetry, how they just listen and enjoy, and he noticed that this passivity that was produced in young people was calculated, right? it was calculated the passivity of the spectator or the listener is a desired effect produced by a calculation of the components of the poetic medium right that's basically more or less his argument that the passivity of the spectator or listener is a desired effect produced by a calculation of the components of the poetic medium but you have to know too that Plato is not talking about uneducated people uh, being being victims 
of this poetic discourse. He says, even the best of us, meaning even, you know, philosophers and thinkers and so on, even the best of us are vulnerable, are affected by a good passage of Homer or the tragedians. Hear and judge, he says, the best of us, as I conceive, when we listen to a passage of Homer or one of the tragedians in which he represents some pitiful hero who is drooling out his sorrows in a long oration or weeping and smiling his, and, and smitting his breast like this, right? Or weeping, you know, with a long oration. He says even the best of us will be affected. He says, the best of us, you know, delight in giving way to sympathy. We will sympathize with this character and are in rapture at the excellence of the poet who stirs our feelings most. And, of course, the, those present in here says, yes, of course. So, Plato's critique of poetry is basically, uh, or falls within an analysis of, being and seeming. He finds that there is a culture in society uh, that encourages people to seem rather than be. Uh, poetry creates a culture of superficiality. People want only to seem just rather than be just. They just want to be seen to be fair rather than be fair. They just want to be seen to be uh, hard-working, but they're not hard-working. This culture of appearance can be most devastating in politics and in law because here the material rewards and economic exploitation are great, right? So the, the, the fraud can be devastating to a society. Fake appearances can be of great use to politicians. They could develop on its basis, on the basis of fake appearances, Politicians can develop lies and fake appearances. Uh, they can develop superficial ideologies with the sole aim of control and profit. The poet and the rhetoricians are recognized as spin doctors who would ensure that people consent to being deceived or exploited. If that is not uh, enough, if that's, you know, it's still not possible, then there is always the option of using force or coercion. Um, and this is a quote from the Republic. He says, nonetheless, the argument in indicates this. If we would be happy to be the path along which we, should pro we would proceed, he says, with a view to concealment, we will establish secret brotherhoods and political clubs. And there are professors of rhetoric um, who teach the art of, <laughs> of persuading courts and assemblies. And so partly by persuasion and partly by force, I shall make unlawful gains and not be punished. So the question is to make unlawful gains and not be punished. And you can use poetry to do that. Um, the superficial culture of poetry produces, that poetry produces is not equally harmful to everybody, you know. Some people suffer from it and some people make profit from it. The benefits that people make from poetry are incentives for many to develop themselves, to develop themselves, to devote themselves to the game of breeding and developing appearances and lies. Only a cover is needed, he says, a picture and shadow of virtue to be the vestibule and exterior of my house. So basically these are the two main points that Plato contributes to literary criticism. First is the distinction between mimesis and diegesis. It's Plato is the first one to make this distinction and this distinction is still very powerful even today and very useful in the analysis of literature. The second contribution is Plato's decision to ban poetry. This is a uh, decision that remains misunderstood today.
And it's only in the 20th century that scholarship started understanding why Plato banned poetry. Uh, basically, the poetry he, he was talking about was different. It was a poetry that uh, functioned more as a system of education, as a source of law, as a source of knowledge. As, and because it was based on rhythm and, and harmony and meter, uh, Plato thought that it was unhealthy to educate youth on that because he, it cripples their mind. It makes them react emotionally rather than think rationally. So, uh, to conclude, I would simply say that it's obvious that for Plato it was a deplorable fact, it was deplorable, that such an experience or communion, the poetic experience, constituted the official, the official um, cultural, the official form of cultural organization, it was the official education. And he didn't like that, it was deplorable. And he felt that the destiny, the fate of an entire nation was based on this poetic institution. And that generations to come, their future is dependent on this poetic experience. It was obvious to him that the Greeks' reliance on such sensational emotionalism as a source of law, education and morality was a very unhealthy state of affair and a recipe for disaster. He said, take a step away from it. That's what he suggested to his people. Take a step away from it and you will realize how poor and fake an experience it is. You will realize, he says, that it is a blind imitation of modes and patterns of being with no recourse to even the most basic sense of evaluation and judgment. Uh, thank you so much, and I will see you next time in our next lecture. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.